Hello and welcome everyone. My name is David Fuller. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Artificial. Uh, we're a three-year-old, young, scrappy startup with reverb on the mic. Um, we sit at the intersection of the life sciences market, which is why we're here. Um, but what we bring to the table is taking the best of digitization, which is more or less all the goodies that the internet has provided but are not yet adopted in the life sciences space um, with a lifetime of automation expertise. Um, by way of my background, uh, I worked at National Instruments, now branded as an I. I ran all of their software and built domain-specific languages like LabVIEW. Um, I'm a tool builder by, by practice. Uh, one of the best, my favorite tools I've ever built is called Lego Mindstorms. So I partnered with the Lego group to create software abstractions for programming kids robots. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about is, hey, how do you make tools that make using complex systems easier, more adoptable, more repeatable? Um, so at Artificial, it's our intent to create the best tools to capture workflows. And, you know, what does that mean? Um, we want them to be cloud-based and we want them to be digital. And so let's explore our tool set and the benefits thereof for your workflows. So a basic question, why cloud? So I like to play you know, armchair pessimist about technology and hype cycles. AI this, you know, AI-driven drug discovery, save the world. Um, you have to do cloud. Uh, why, why do you have to do cloud? Um, so a very basic view from my point of view, when I talk about all the goodies that the internet has to offer, do not underestimate the power and scale of the cloud. The world's largest integrated system is the internet. This seems sort of obvious. It makes it the most powerful computational networking and storage tool on the planet, internet scale. So you get that as a fundamental and immediate benefit. Another sort of hype cycle I often think about is really why digital. You know, not, it's not because Accenture proposed that you need a digital transformation strategy or your CFO has a goal to mandate that you hire a chief digital officer and digitize your business process. Um, in the end, you want a digital representation because it provides meaningful structure. It provides repeatability. It rep provides shareability. So there are intrinsic properties that the cloud offers. I highly recommend and encourage that we all adopt those elements so that we can get those properties. And digital is really about taking the time to encode and structure your workflow. So when I take these concepts that are sort of meta and abstract and apply them to the reality of what I see in the lab stack today, I get a mess that looks something like this. So what we have is an arbitrarily false accreted separation between informatics and automation. Why does that separate? Well, it's because the people who have the expertise to understand the science and model it in the information domain do so while ignoring the stuff they don't know about, and vice versa. So this should be a group who's fairly familiar with automation. You live on the other side of that bridge. And yes, you understand some of the scientific principles, but you only understand them necessarily for you to execute your automation flow. So this market, has evolved a set of silos. Silos at every layer. Some of that is an intentional effort by some of the more well-established brands in this market to deliver a walled garden strategy, which is a no-no in a digital ecosystem that you really wanna have best practices of the internet and all of the integration that comes with it. But we really haven't adopted the best of the internet and applied the concepts of openness and APIs and integrated systems to the stack that we have. So what you end up doing is if you have a lab and you want to do something in your lab and you want it to be data driven and somewhat optimal and have some notion of coherency, is you take this mess and you try to structure it. Now, I was the CTO of the KUKA group. So it was the fourth largest robot company on the planet. And we do massively high throughput systems for warehouses and car production. I didn't realize, though I should have, what a luxury it was to have a standard stack in the factory. So you can get a book, you can look at an IEC specification, and it will tell you what every layer of your stack is supposed to look like. On top of that, they've standardized the APIs at most layers. Not all layers, but at most layers. So when I came into this market, 
and I'm trying to create value-added software, which I'll share with you in a, in a moment, I said, where's my driver abstraction? And you basically don't have one. And so you have a bunch of folks that have built out driver libraries. You have good-hearted, well-intentioned standards like CELA. They simply are not broadly adopted enough, and the customers haven't demanded that the walled gardens fall down, and the vendors aren't doing their part, and, and, and. And so the preconditions for standardization at all of these layers are demanding customers. So if you're a demanding customer, please demand open APIs. It's a willing set of enlightened vendors. So if your vendor is enlightened and has an open APIs, give them more business. And then super important, you actually have to have a viable, approachable, technical stack that isn't too complex, so it can be broadly adopted. So we need to take another bite at the apple on standardizing our stack and standardizing the fundamental layers, and it's mainly a business problem, followed shortly thereafter as a technical problem. So when we look at all of this, our mission at Artificial is to smooth over with pre-integrated elements of that entire stack. We want to make it very, very approachable and very easy to request work of all kinds in your lab, have that end-to-end -end workflow execute seamlessly, deliver the result, and provide a seamless mechanism from request to result through digital workflows running in the cloud. So more or less, I want all the goodies of digital I talked about, all the goodies of cloud, and I want to apply it within the lab context. So when we talk about the artificial product and our product suite, you know, we really looked at what are the stuff that's in a lab doing work and has to be dealt with. And so one other element which I find ironic given my strong background in robotics, I sort of really love the fact that a huge amount of the work in the lab is what I'll call hybrid automation. Humans in the loop, people are gonna do stuff. People are gonna make decisions, people are gonna set up decks on liquid handlers, they're gonna make boo-boos and mistakes, they're not gonna understand how to fill up the buffer reagent, maybe they forgot to empty the trash, the robot drops a plate. You know, we have all of this wonderful variability in what I'll call a hybrid automation scenario. So if you have a workflow tool and it claims to be modern and it says I'm gonna do end-to-end -end workflows, it needs to deal with the heterogeneity of the hardware ecosystem, it needs to deal with the heterogeneity of the software systems. I mean, many, many of you probably have your own custom bespoke limbs or some sort of information database somewhere because you didn't like what was available or it's your secret sauce. So there's all of these different elements that have to be integrated in order to properly say, I can do end-to-end -end workflows. So we have set about doing that. And so when I started my intro, I was talking about being a tool builder and so, obviously, we decided to build some tools. So, when we first started analyzing this space, I, I had a snarky quote from someone, and it was basically, if you've seen one lab, you've seen one lab. So everybody has you know, their own little way of doing everything, and they, it, it's unique, and, and it's sort of a setup. So how do you deal with automating that, or orchestrating that, or integrating that? Um, so what we've done is three specific editors. Um, built around how do I create a rich digital twin of my lab. So you can see some of our videos online and I'll show you some things here in a little bit. Uh, my co-founder Nikita will be talking about the first two editors, labs and assistants um, tomorrow at 12 in this, this very room. I'll be focused on workflows today. So we have an editor for describing digital twins because you need to know what's in your lab and what it does. We have an editor for describing digital SOPs that are interactive and parameter parameterizable, so that you can guide people as part of your workflows. And then, of course, you need the punchline, which is these digital workflows. Once all of that is constructed, and we make it as easy as possible to do, then you can have a command center that's cloud-hosted, web-available app called LabOps, where you can schedule work, optimize work, and see the running state of your workflows and the gathered data. So. Diving in just a bit on workflows. So what we have here on the left is, a, is our digital twin, a physical a digital representation of a lab. It includes the perfectly spatially accurate model, a kinematic model of how stuff moves, how stuff connects. We call it common sense lab physics. 
And basically, this is a really quick editor where you can drag and drop and set up, hey, I've got this high res system, I've got this incubator, I've got this precise arm, here's how it all moves. So really rapid, quick lab layout. A little secret, behind the scenes, we're using that to create a data ontology of your lab to hang data off of. I love the pretty picture, but I really love the data structure. So that's one key part. On the, your right, we have what we call orchestration Python. So when I was running LabVIEW at National Instruments, I had 300 engineers working on the language and 300 engineers working on the drivers. I'm a small, scrappy startup. We're not going to create a new language. So what we did was look for the most ubiquitous language available with adjacencies to the automation space, particularly data science, and that's Python. So what we've done is created a Python subset that allows you to sequence a series of actions, what we call actions, and behind the scenes, we're taking that and feeding it to a dynamic resource assigning scheduler. Okay? So basically, you see the thing there that says load system? That's a digital instruction set for a person. So that's an action that says, you need to load this system. Then in that digital twin, I know all the people and all the equipment that can, quote, load the system. I know their availability and how long it takes. So I'm creating a schedule of durations and a map of actions to your assets. And that ultimately is what gets run. So on top of that, you can write your own building blocks that feed into this. So we have an open SDK where you can write anything in the world that you can do in Python and then provide that to your team. So for us, this is a key part of providing low-code digital workflows where you can talk to both equipment, you can talk to people, and you know, any one of those actions could also talk to your own custom limbs. I mean, literally, it'd be like define function, call funky limbs, you know, post a rest message, get a value back, put it up into the workflow. When this is running and being scheduled, because we did write a compiler, we know everything about the workflow. And we're data logging, cloud and edge, every single input, every single duration of every action, every error that occurred, every log file that was associated with it, and you end up with a data record structured in the form of your workflow. So we also talk about cloud. So that was just digital. It's like, hey, I have a library. It's extensible. It's really awesome. I find people that know Python. They can do whatever they need to do. On top of that, we've abstracted the actual management of the life cycle of your workflow. So kind of behind the scenes, we're basically using GitHub to version and manage your Python code for you. It's beautifully auditable. It's one of the most ubiquitous versioning and control systems on the planet. And on top of that, when you compile the workflow with our tool, you hit a little button that says publish to cloud, and we'll automatically ensure that it works in your lab, that you have the equipment that's needed for it to run. We'll push it up into the cloud, and it'll become immediately available globally for anybody in, who has the rights to run those workflows in your lab. So global cloud observability of workflows published from anywhere, written using very standard languages, fully extensible with anything Python can do. So that's sort of the punchline of the whole set of abstractions around cloud and digital. So this slide is basically a lifetime of pain, my pain, and learnings about how to properly construct abstractions for tools. So at the bottom, we want Python, which is basically, I could have put anything there that was a standard language, but I need it so that you guys who are massively expert and provide fundamental building blocks to the rest of your organization can do whatever you need to do. So no constraints, knock yourself out. Once you've built that library up, and we're building the libraries up too for common functions, and you can write your own, we have a low-code abstraction with this orchestration Python I was mentioning that has the scheduler behind it. We have a future vision, too, and this was the vision before ChatGPT was the, all the hotness. This is what I studied at KUKA as well, um, is higher levels abstraction in both spatial form and in written form. So a little preview of that. Um, this is something we're working on called digital twin workflows. 
And because we have a complete information model of equipment, we have the common sense lab physics where we know where plates can go and how plates can fit and where tubes can fit and how the TCAN deck can be laid out. You can basically grab a plate and start saying, hey, my workflow is gonna move this set of plates from this location to this other location. And when it gets to the plate shaker, I wanna shake. And so this is a non-programming, no-code, digital representation of a workflow where you're just dragging plates around and saying, hey, do the thing the Hamilton does when the plate gets to the Hamilton thing. It's very, very intuitive spatial representation. Every human being is excellent at moving things from one place to another. It's what we do really well. So this is in work. I'm absolutely excited about it. I think it's gonna be pretty amazing. So in summary, would love to partner with you guys, open up our tool set to everyone here, create your workflows in our tool set. I think I've articulated why digital. I think I've articulated why cloud. I'll give a little anecdote and then I'll shut it down for questions. So I've built distributed control systems like five times. It's super exciting. I've done it many times for product form. When you ship a control system out, say for the first time, and somebody in Axaray, Turkey is trying to run you know, their factory, and there's a bug, you know, the thick, find fix cycle is like literally fly someone to Turkey, have them sit there, log in, work on this stuff, come back, maybe I have a fix, release it, test it, and go. This is the first cloud-based system I've released. We have complete global visibility into the running systems. I have experts in Germany that can log in, edit, hotfix, and deploy customer code, our code. It's amazing. Like I can log in 24-7 and observe the functioning of a system, hotfix everything. It's, it's beautiful, I love it. Um, I highly encourage you to try it. It's also pretty, pretty fun. So that's it for the talk. Um, we are in early access for the Python SDK and orchestration Python tools. Um, this is a journey for us. We're going to do those digital twin workflows next so everybody can create workflows. Um, I encourage you guys to come by the booth, have a chat. Very open for questions. So thank you guys for your time and attention so far. <laughs> questions? Anyone? Not one question. All right, there we go. You showed the visual aspect of moving the plates around through that GUI that you had there. Would you also need to program the same things within the liquid handlers as well? Right, great question. So yes, you'd still have to do the liquid handler programming of the specific movements within the deck of the, of the liquid handler. I think it's an interesting conversation to have with some of the liquid handler vendors who we, we know pretty well. Um, but I think the concept of a WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get kind of thing for a deck also makes a ton of sense. It's just another set of spatial layouts at a lower level of resolution. Great question, but not today. You uh, mentioned kind of early on the uh, dearth of standards in this industry compared to previous industries you've worked in. Um, how do you see your product kind of fitting into that absent space or the existing landscape of heterogeneous products and solutions? Yep, great question. So the first thing is we have open web standard APIs to all the functionality. So you know we show the pretty picture of like dragging a plate around and all of that stuff. All of that you could, you know, if you had a deck layout and you wanted to programmatically construct the deck, using our APIs, totally open, right? So that's one thing. I probably shouldn't talk about it quite yet, but we basically, I built drivers, like my first driver at age 18 I, for National Instruments, and then I built all the tools to write drivers, and as OPC, and like I love the topic. We built a driver development toolkit for ourselves first. Um, I intentionally made it unencumbered by any artificial specific technology. So it's pure Python and pure .NET, it's pure REST APIs wrapped around it. Um, all of that you know, is intended for an open ecosystem of people that want to write drivers like that. Um, you know, how that makes its way into the community, whether it be open source, which would make sense, which is why it's devoid of any of our technology, you know, is TBD. But 
Yes, we would like to follow the same principles even with the drivers we create. Because if I didn't do that, I'd be sort of a, a hypocrite, <laughs> which I don't want to be. <laughs> so. Uh, so in future, would there be a possibility of a closed system for uh, enterprise situation where a cloud system is not possible due to water policy? Sure, I love this topic. Um, so on-premise, air-gapped, or whatever terms you want to use, um, you know, is something we can do. I'm avoiding it as long as possible. So, for example, in 2018, I started a cloud-based fleet management software for KUKA, and basically Daimler and BMW said, get the hell out of here. <laughs> You're not, we're not going to do that. Um, two years later, they signed a giant contract with Microsoft. They put everything in a data lake, and they're like, hey, can you put your stuff in our cloud? And I was like, yeah, for sure. So I anticipate people saying I need to be air-gapped on-prem, and this is my critical data. My, my, my answer is, you know, if the check's big enough, we'll put it on-premise, and it's, it's your critical data. Um, my other answer to that is, you know, if we run the world's economy on the cloud, I think your data's okay. Yeah. I'm curious. A lot of this deals with specific movements and how do you get from one step to another. But it's kind of higher level scientific question where you might, you're really looking for an answer for specific things. There's a set of steps, like maybe gene editing, culture, et cetera, which needs to be done. Could we, do you think we'll get to a place in this industry where we can define this high level question out of these steps and then not actually worry about how you map it to this set of instruments you have? And really just describe, here's the data I want, here's the transformations I want, here's some of the details, and then just have it run in a variety of setups. Great question. So I think the dream, that's a vision as a, as a thing to aspire to. So I think that is the right North Star. I think I would, and where we are starting and sort of one of the great debates with my co-founder was can we create portable workflows across heterogeneous equipment, right? Um, the first step is I would like to have APIs that are vendor agnostic and enough metadata to map to compliant hardware. And so we've already done that in several workflows where there's the abstract notion of you know, a DNA isolation. And then there's like three subsystems that can all do DNA isolation. They have different plate capacities and availabilities, and then the system determines which is the right one. So the idea of portable workflows that are dynamically remappable to hardware is a really hard problem, but I really like it. So I think it's something we should try for. I think it's achievable. Question. Um, I'm a big fan of, of digital twins. In particular, uh, m my interest is in using them in uh, discrete event simulations to do optimization. So before you even spend your first million dollars on hardware, you can actually have your workflow optimized and understand your bottlenecks, mm -hmm. understand your air recovery uh, protocols and so forth. I mean, what's your thoughts about how, how your system could be used to help develop some of these simulation models? It's a great question. I mean, for those of you that have any background on the factory side, you know, Siemens created this concept of digital factory in like 2010, um, and it was built around the concept of digital twins tied to discrete event simulators, right? Um, it's a great idea, and it has all the benefits you just described. Um, so our workflows can run in simulation mode or not, and they're all time timed, so we can run with a simulation time axis and you can literally run the water through the pipes and see what's going to happen exactly like you said. Um, it's not a pure discrete event simulator to be like pedantic on the, the actual thing, um, but it's definitely designed for simulation. And you know, we have close partnerships with some vendors that have very open scheduling systems. And so there's a beautiful topography of like, spin up a Solario VM in the cloud, spin up our digital twin next to it, run your workflow and see what happens. Um, so one of the key benefits is, is simulatability, for sure. Okay, I think we're done. We're over time. So thank you guys for the questions and your time and attention.